I could, I could give the entire lecture in semaphore. It's like the cover of Help. Is that dated? The Beatles Help record, they're doing Help in semaphore. Do you know this? Do you know, Beatles, band, 60s. Paul McCartney's still alive. George isn't. Okay. Uh, Okay, very good. Um, I was going to talk about this, uh, some other, okay, we were talking about Giorgione at the end of class on, on Monday. And we were talking about Renaissance art, high Renaissance art in Venice, and how it has a particularly different character than Rome or Florence. And that takes a number of different um, uh, guises, if you will. There's a number of different ways we see a difference. But in particular, because Venice has no Roman ruins. Remember, Venice was founded late, right? Seventh century, in the Middle Ages, after the quote-unquote fall of Rome. So they're not really as interested in Roman body types, right? That kind of Renaissance that we saw with, with Michelangelo or, or, or with Raphael, right? Or with Polaiuolo or Botticelli. They're not interested in that as much. Um, they're interested in other things. Uh, they still have Renaissance naturalism or realism. That's certainly part of it. They know how to do perspective. There's some elements of the Renaissance that are still there. But uh, what they're interested in, it seems more so, is, is a sort of poetic approach to painting. Um, and in particular, what they've been looking back at, the bit of ancient Rome that makes this Renaissance, that they've been looking back at are what are called pastoral poems, pastoral poetry. <laughs> poems that evoke the natural countryside and that uh, talk about the sort of ideal life of the pre-industrial world, if you will. This is well before the Industrial Revolution, but you get what I'm talking about, right? The sort of, I don't want to say pre-civilized, but the pre-urbanized world. Um, and that many of these poems are set in a mystical place, a, a mythological place called Arcadia, where time has stood still and things are still perfect before we ruined it with all of our progress. Right? And what Giorgione does, and the way we see this is um, the landscape is given sort of a pretty heavy hand in this picture. About half of the picture is given over, a little bit less than half of the picture, is given over to this expansive landscape. And you'll notice that in addition to that, he's kicked the Holy Family and Jesus, who are, who are really the subject matter here, right? They're the focus, but you notice where he's put them, is way off to the side. So that if we think about the center of the picture, the focus, the place your eye normally goes, it's the shepherds, right? Whereas if we think back to Duccio, where we saw the shepherds at the Nativity way early on, you know, they're, they're off to the side, and it's the virgin and child that are the center. So he sort of upended that in a way. And uh, that's coming from this, is this interest in, in, in this sort of bucolic life, this you know, perfect existence and that really only happens in the countryside. And the other way that we know that they're looking at these poems is if we look at the motifs that he includes in this ever-expanding landscape, and we know that he opened up more and more of the landscape. He kept pushing the rocks over to the right as he was painting. Right? We know this through x-rays, that he kept opening up more and more landscape. Um, but the things that he includes there, right? Uh, distant blue mountains, rivers running through, uh, creeks babbling. These are the things that we find when we read uh, Roman pastoral poetry, or evocations of of, of this sort of sumptuous landscape. And as we look back there, we see that not only do we have the shepherds in the foreground, but we have at least three other groups of shepherds there. There's the pair by the tree, there's the man in the hut, there's a couple by the side of the, of the, uh, of the shore as well, which are a little bit harder to see. So these are there to get us to wander visually through the landscape. And imagine, that's what these poems are about. What's it like to wander in the landscape? And that's what what uh, George Oni wants us to do as well, visually, wander through the landscape. So uh, there are shepherds, and then you can see the, the couple by the side of the, of the, I'm assuming it's a river because there are these mills there and a little bit of rapids. It looks kind of like a lake, but I think it's the bend of a river. And you can see very small, a pair of figures just here um, as well in, in the landscape. Uh, 
and of course a fellow in the hut uh, on the left. But you'll notice that these shepherds back here, and we can see one of their sheep as well, are looking up to the upper left corner. And in the upper left corner, what they see is an angel with the message, uh, right? The, telling the shepherds where to go. The, the, the Savior has been born. You need to go over there by that hole in the rock, you know, and there you'll see him. So the ones in the back are, are sort of, you know, uh, they're not these guys a second time because they're dressed differently. But there are other shepherds who are about to follow the message. And you'll notice that Giorgione, in putting the angel up there, has made it so that the angel is, in fact, a source of light. If we look behind that tree, you'll notice that the sunlight is falling on the side of that building. But that's on the other side of that tree, and there's a light on this side of the tree that's coming from that angel. And you can see, if you follow it down, that, that the light that falls in a pool on Christ is coming from that angel. And this is why the two shepherds in the foreground are casting a shadow, right? And so what Giorgione is doing is making this really kind of interesting play between the holy light that's directing uh, the two foreground shepherds and natural light in the background, which falls on these buildings, which are in ruins in the background. Again, civilization, not so hot. Countryside, nice. Right? And we saw buildings as metaphors too with Van Eyck, didn't we? Where the ruined roof of the Annunciation building was to indicate that things aren't really as they should be and in need of something better. Right? Giorgione doesn't know that work, but he's giving us something very different. And you'll notice that the ruins stand in front of a more dense civilization, urbanization, further in the background. But even that seems to have some areas that are sketchy. Right? It's either scaffolding or ruins back there. But it's all lit by nature, whereas the foreground is lit by God or heaven. Right? And, and Giorgio is making that point by giving us a little, another little natural light in the background. Right? With that torch that's in the one little arched window back there. Right? Which you can see in the detail on the left. Right? So this play between natural and... and, and, and uh, and holy light is something that George is playing with. And we've seen other artists play with that idea of the holy light. I really like this painting a lot. Somebody's working on it, I think, aren't they? Somebody said they were. Uh, they're afraid to fess up or not here tonight. Um, I especially like those little bubble-headed angels. They look like soap bubbles about to go right up there. They're just the wings and a head uh, is all you get for the angels at this point. right? And it's also a really cute Jesus. They've really, uh, Giorgione is a fantastic baby painter. He's really, really good. As are his pupils. They, they, do, they do children well. This is the first baby. He looks like a baby. He doesn't look like a, a little you know, man. I think we talked about this before with some other ones that we saw. But he doesn't quite look any more like a little, like a little man who just happens to be small. Well, we're running behind, so I'm not going to talk about this one as much as I should. There's a couple of heavy hitters from this period that kind of every intro class usually talks about, but we're focusing more on local works of art. But I did want to show this to you simply because, and I'm not going to go into it in great depth, but to show that the same idea about nature as a metaphor, right? Uh, the landscape as this evocation of pastoral poetry, of an escape from the urban world, that Giorgione treats this theme in non-Christian imagery as well. Right? There's really particularly nothing Christian about this. And even more unchristian, really, than like Botticelli's Birth of Venus, because there, at least, we could look at it and say, oh, Venus, Mary, and see those philosophical analogies between theology and, 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 and mythological history. Right? The Neoplatonic connections. But with this, there's really quite nothing in the way of religious overtones. This is a truly secular picture. And it has, in many ways, a, a theme that's not unlike the adoration of the magi, or the shepherds, in that we have people who have come to visit something in the foreground. And you can see the way the, 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 the painting is set up, is that we again have ruined civilization in the background. And we've got a bridge going across the river. There's even a figure crossing that bridge. And the path kind of leads us down the left-hand side to where we've come to this wooded area that's getting away from civilization. 
And just as our man here on the left, who's come probably from the city, and we'll talk more about that in a second, has made his way around, so too the city seems to be encroaching. It's almost like this is an urban growth boundary that you read about in urban planning, right? That we're sort of at that place where it's the edge of where the city's developed so far. And it's almost like a proto-ecological picture about the violation of a perfect landscape by the spread of cities. And so we have half-built architecture directly behind this guy, right? You can see the wall is incomplete, and, and George only makes a point of showing us the wall is incomplete. The columns are half-built or half-ruined, depending on how you look at it. And this is up four grabs that way, simply because, again, I think it's, a, it's poetic. It's elusive, right? Elusive, it eludes us, but elusive, it makes allusions to things, right? So our fellow has come out of the city in the background, worked his way around, and now he's come to nature itself. By the way he's dressed, we know that he's from Venice. There was an acting and musical group called the Company of the Stocking, and he's wearing their outfit, right? So he is a Venetian. He's not just any urban dweller. He's from Venice. And anybody seeing this picture around 1510 would have known that, right? He's a Venetian. So he is out of his natural element, right? He's out of the city, and he's into the countryside. And he's come into the countryside, one presumes, just to get away from the city. And what does he find when he gets down there? He sees this woman nursing a baby, right? Now, I think that she's not just a woman nursing a baby. I think she's an allegory. I think she's nature personified. Because Mother Nature nurtures us. We all derive our nourishment from nature. And she's there nestled in that bush. So I think that we're meant to think of her as his inspiration. What does he see when he looks out at these trees having come out of his town in the background? And what does, what does he see when he's come here? He, he understands nature for it, the way it gives back to us. And the way that George Ernie gets this idea across is he shows us nature two ways, right? As the uh, sort of somewhat dark trees and bushes, but then also as this woman nursing a child. At the same time, there's another undercurrent to this that we're going to see in a lot of Venetian pictures, and that is sex. I've said it. Sex, right? Because look at how, is that how you hold a baby when you're nursing it? It's not even on her lap. It's behind her leg, right? And so she's got to turn her breast over to do it. And the whole point of putting the baby away is so that we can see her, so that he can see her nakedness. Right? Which is weird because there's nothing less erotic than a woman nursing. But Giorgione is going to give it that charge. And so she's looking out at you because you can see her too. We presume this is for a male audience. Right? But also she's turned toward him. And if we look at him, he's just like, mm-hmm. Right? He's watching her. And he's holding on to that Freudian stick. You know what Freud once said is sometimes a cigar is just a cigar? Well, that's not just a cigar, right? That is meant as a metaphor for something more. And the fact that he makes a lightning bolt strike in the sky at the moment that we're seeing this is meant to add that element of charge. That's why it's called the Tempest, right? It has nothing to do with Shakespeare. Tempest is the word for storm. And you'll notice the amount of atmosphere we have here that we also had in Giorgione's shepherd's picture. This again is, is kind of a hallmark of Venetian painting. They love atmosphere. Right? So he has these interests in, in, in landscape that we see also in his, uh, his non-Christian pictures, just as we saw with the, with the adoration of the shepherds. Now, Giorgione's pupil was one of the most important and famous artist of the 16th century. His name is Titian, right? The T-I is soft, Titian. 
um, studied under Giorgione, painted this about the year that Giorgione died. It's very close in a lot of ways to Giorgione's style, and it's quite close to the Tempest in its subject matter. In fact, some people used to think it was Giorgione, since neither of them are signed. But we're pretty sure now it's Titian based on technical studies. And it's pretty much the same theme. We've got somebody from the city who's made their way into the countryside to find some escape from the city. And you'll notice that the fellow from the city is, again, a member of the Company of the Stockings, just very similar to our man in the lower left corner of the Giorgione picture. Right? And they wore these mis mismatched socks, usually one of them multicolored. Right? And so you can see he's got a beautiful stripe down the front, right? that, that uh, beige and white stocking on. And he's a musician. He's gone out to the countryside to play. Now, who's he met? Who's the guy he's playing with, as it were? This is a shepherd. And we know that because there's another one directly behind him with the flock down the hill on the right. Right? And so he's playing his song for the shepherd, which is kind of, or maybe he's learning his song from the shepherd. Because shepherds have a tradition, in art especially, of being musicians. Remember with Duccio, like our first week of class, we saw the shepherds there with their flock, and they had bagpipes as well. Right? Shepherds were traditionally musicians. And so there's every chance that he's learning his song from the shepherd. Right? And we think about that in broader terms. Not just as an illustration of an event, but think about it as a metaphor for something more. Right? Then it becomes really close to this. He's gone out to nature, and in seeing nature, he learns something. Right? Our, our man from the Tempest learns about the nurturing qualities of nature. Right? The nurturing nature of nature. I'm trying to say that a few times fast. Right? And our fellow learns his song. Now, at the same time he's encountered the shepherd, he's also encountered two naked women. Here again, most likely these are personifications. They are nature's qualities given human form. Now that's something we find quite often in ancient Roman art. So maybe he is looking a bit more at old Roman art. Titian, we know, will travel to the city of Rome on a number of different occasions. And this idea of personifying natural forces in human form is something we see all over Roman art. So what we have here with the two women are personifications of inspiration, of nature inspiring him, of this alternative world inspiring him. So one of them is either dipping water out of or pouring water into a well. Either way, isn't that inspiration, right? Water from the well. You're filling up my cup, right? Or drawing water for me to drink. Either way, it's about inspiration. It's about being fulfilled. The other one holds a flute. Right. And is part of the music, I think, that our musician is hearing in his head. She's his inspiration. Now, all of that said, again, sex. Pretty heavy sexual overtones with this as well. Those guys are awfully close to each other. They're leaning in. And if we look at the shepherd on the right, right he's, first, our, our, our musician is kind of looking longingly into the eyes of the shepherd, very deeply into the eyes of the shepherd. But the shepherd's not really looking into his eyes. The shepherd's looking at what's going on behind the lute. And if we think about what's going on behind the lute, do you get my meaning here? I'm being recorded. Then again, we can talk about Freud. Now, Freud's not until the 19th century, and, you know, Titian knows nothing about Freud. But look at where that pipe is placed if we think about the general arrangement, not in space, but in two dimensions, right? Sometimes a pipe is just a pipe, but that's not just a pipe, right? That one is about what the kind of erotic charge, in this case, homoerotic charge, 
that's there within this sense of inspiration. So these pictures by Titian and Giorgione are about as unpious as anything we're going to see for quite a long time. Right? These are very modern in a way. And one of the things that we will see as we move through the centuries is that painters love Titian. He's a painter's painter. Uh, and that we're not going to be able to go more than 50 years in any given country without somebody going, oh, there's some Titian there going on. And we'll look at this more as we look at some other works, right? By Titian, some local works. Okay? So uh, it, it's incredibly modern in that it's very untraditional, very unchristian at this particular point. There is that taste for these that we've already seen developing in other camps, even with the papacy um, and his taste for ancient Roman philosophy. Now, Titian's interest in, in sensuality, um, his ability to render these images that have these strong sexual undertones, made him, in fact, quite popular. And um, in the 1520s, actually around 1520 itself, 1517, 1520, Titian was commissioned, right? His services were bought by the Duke of Ferrara. Now, Titian is in Venice, right? Ferrara is in northern Italy, not too far away. And he had heard news of Titian's talents. Uh, by this time, Titian had painted a couple major altarpieces in Venice. And he hires him to come and decorate his palace. Uh, he had had some pictures there. Uh, he had wanted a whole series, uh, hired a bunch of artists to paint pictures for him in 1510 or so, and they all died before they got it done, all except for one. And he wants Titian to come and finish the series. And these are going to be in his private study, and it's, it's sort of a fascinating thing. It's been destroyed, and the paintings are scattered. But the, stu the study where these were painted, placed, these pictures by Titian, not the one on the right, but this one on the left, were act the, the whole study was carved out of alabaster, which is this sort of like agate, softer, but has iridescent like agate on the walls. And these would be set in it. It was this pleasure palace. And the scenes, even though they go back now to ancient mythology, unlike the pastoral symphony, the scenes, again, are as erotic and secular as you can possibly get. So here is uh, the residents of the island of Andros having a bacchanal. Do you know what a bacchanal is? A drunken orgy. It's a party, a party of Bacchus. Bacchus is the Roman god of wine. Bacchus is Dionysus in Rome. Okay, Dionysus is the Greek god of wine. Bacchus is the Roman god of wine. And so a bacchanal, it's a frat party, right? It's a kegger, if you will, right? Only more so, over the top. And Titian paints it utterly unjudgmentally. It's, it's all about sensuality. And you can see, holy moly, with the girl in the lower right corner, sets the tone for the entire thing, right? Has drank so much that she's laying back and sort of arching her back and showing her stuff. And that sets the tone for everything. And Titian throughout shows this revelry, dancing and so forth, uh, you know, the, the lack of inhibitions that comes from, from having drank too much, right? A nice moral warning anymore for us. But here in, in Alfonso de Este's uh, palace, these are not put forth at all uh, judgmentally, right? So we have dancing, we have figures who are playing music, again, pipes, uh, bodices falling down as the music is, is there. Apparently it can be read for people who can read music. I'm not one of them, right? Uh, you can actually make out the tune that they're playing. There's an overturned wine glass in the foreground there. Uh, she can't wait to get another little bowl full of wine that the naked guy is pouring for her. Here on the left, the satyr figure. Uh, in Andros, the, the streams run with wine. And so you can see the figure in the lower left corner filling up his pitcher from the streams full of wine. And everybody just drinking, singing, playing music. And, of course, our woman. And then 
the other offshoot of one is having to go and, and not being able to get to the toilet, right? And there's our little key, our little putti figure there peeing uh, right back, giving it right back into the stream that they're drawing the water from, right? So these are these are actually meant to be quasi humorous as well, right? At the same time, being very uh, uh, visually sensuous, about as sensuous as they can be. So Titian began to get a, a, a reputation as a, a mythological painter with these series of images that he made for the Duke of Ferrara uh, for his pleasure palace. Now, like I mentioned, the, the project was begun earlier, right? The Duke of Ferrara originally commissioned a bunch of artists, including Raphael, to do the first set. And they all died before they got it done, with the exception of one work, which is, by coincidence, downtown, right? This was the only one in the series that was finished before Titian took it up. And it's by one of Titian's other teachers. He, was, he studied under Giorgione, but he also spent some time studying under Giovanni Bellini, who's one of a family of painters in Venice, right? And in uh, 1510, 1514, uh, Alfonso d'Este commissions from Bellini the first painting in this series. Paint other people as well, but like I said, they all died. And then about 10 years later, Titian comes in to sort of pull it all together, right? Got this, make three more pictures that go with this. And in order to make it work, one of the things that Titian did was he repainted part of the background. So that you'll look, notice that look at the light that's falling on the drunken guy in the back of Titian's picture on the right. And you can see that that hill and that light continues into the background of Bellini's work. That's because Titian came back and painted this background over a range of trees that was originally there. Right? So he jazzed it up a bit in order to make them fit side by side. And that was perfectly fine with Alfonso Deste. He wanted them to be a suite of works. But this one more or less set the theme for the rest, which is all about drunken revelry. And you'll notice that uh, Titian's sexy woman in the corner is a quote of the woman in the corner of the Bellini. Right? To tie them together. Yeah? But also how different it is, the way it moves back into space versus being arranged directly across the foreground. He's really upping the ante here. Um, now, since this one is a local work, I wanted to spend a little bit of time with it talking about what's going on. In this case, again, we're talking about works of art that are based on ancient Roman poems that are set in the countryside. Right? Pastoral poetry. And in this one, it's a certain variety of pastoral poetry. There are lots of kinds of pastoral poetry. But one of them dealt with uh, the Roman gods frolicking in the countryside, out in this untamed nature. And the poet that this derives from is the Roman poet Ovid, uh, one of the primary pastoral poets. And he, he wrote this uh, set of poems called the Feasts of the Gods, right? And that's what the title now is derived from, is Ovid's Feasts of the Gods. But one of the poems talks about a party uh, where, uh, again, as Roman parties often do, everybody got drunk, right? Uh, so this is a party that's hosted by Bacchus. And Bacchus appears, the wine god, in this case, as an infant, as a child. So the baby on the left who is tapped the keg and is filling the pitcher with white wine is Bacchus himself. He's the host of the party. Sometimes Bacchus will appear as a full adult, but not in this particular picture. He is uh, he's here, and the fact that he's drawing more wine ties into the overall scene. You can see everybody's got wine jugs or beautiful blue and white bowls. There's another overturned cup in the foreground. There's a big wine vat in the lower right corner with the wooden handles on which Bellini has tacked his signature. 
That piece of paper has Bellini's signature on it. So it's almost like he's joining Bacchus. He's going to, you know, entice us with this, uh, the scene of revelry, right? Now, during the party, according to Ovid, uh, Lotus, who is, uh, I have to look this up because I never can, right? She is the nymph of the fresh waters. So she's one of these personifications, if you will. She's the goddess of fresh water. Right? Uh, she's a symbol in Roman poetry of chastity, pureness. And in this particular poem, Lotus has drank herself to sleep. Right? And conveniently, her top has fallen off. Or we presume maybe somebody has taken advantage of her. This is a jerky picture, right? bad behavior personified. And that's kind of the point, right? So the fellow behind her is looking down, giggling. He's drunk too, look at his face. And he's proceeding to take off her clothes as she has now fallen asleep. There, in front of her, you can see a, a, a glass jug full of wine, full of red wine, and immediately next to it, the, uh, uh, the wine vat with Bellini's signature on it. So that's Lotus, uh, the man that is um, abusing her, taking advantage of her, is Priapus. Have you ever heard of Priapus? If you're meek, you might want to turn away. Priapus was the god of, I'll tell you this part, right? He's the god of virility, the god of the harvest, right? And uh, so in many ways, this idea of the nymph of the spring, right, the woman who's associated with nature being ravaged by the god of harvest was meant as a broader allegory that's not so nasty. But put in human terms, it becomes ugly, right? Because what do we do, right? We harvest from Mother Nature, right? Mother Earth. And so in this particular case, uh, Priapus has hung his scythe, the reaping scythe, in the tree directly above them because, you know, he's got bigger fish to fry, other fields to plow. That's a better metaphor, right? So he's hung up his scythe. He's going to do something else. Now, since Priapus is the god of the harvest and the god of virility, in art, going back to Roman times, Priapus appears with an incredibly huge maleness monster. I've got a picture. So if you don't want to see it, now's the time to look down. Right? That's a Roman. There's Priapus. Yeah? This is who he is. Right? Now, Bellini's got a little bit of good taste to not show him that way. Right? But you'll notice if you look at his clothing that it kind of bunches up big in certain areas. And in a sort of snarky sneering way, the figure directly behind him is holding the neck of a violin right there, right? So this is to allude to who Priapus is, right, uh, through these other elements. And, and I think that that kind of, um, I don't know, Hugh Hefner just died, that sort of playboy smirk is, is sort of some of the attitude that Bellini and uh, the Duke of Ferrara are hoping that you, the viewer, in that particular situation, take from this. Right? Everybody else is also beginning to sort of get cozy. Right? So Persephone is being groped by Neptune. Persephone is the goddess of the spring. Neptune, you know, is the, the god of, of the oceans. Um, directly from between his knees comes his trident. And he's looking over. Uh, she's welcoming it. She's got her hand behind his neck, but he's got his hand down there, right? And as the story goes, as Ovid, no, okay, so now we go back to Ovid. What's going to happen next, right? Because it looks like everything's kind of going toward R-rated movies, maybe even deeper than that, an NC-17, right? Uh, what happens is that uh, Silenus is here. He's one of the friends of Bacchus. He's an old drunkard. And he's got this donkey. 
And according to Ovid's play, the donkey uh, whinnies. He brays. Right. <laughs> and Priapus wakes up and everybody has a good laugh, right? Because date rape's so darn funny. Right? That was meant as a joke. It's not funny. Right. But we see the moment just before the donkey is about to let loose and wake her up and everybody, you know, Priapus caught in the act. Right, um, and so in fact, you see his mouth almost open, but not quite. Right, so this establishes the scene for the sort of pleasure room of Alfonso d'Este in Ferrara. Uh, Bellini begins it, and then Titian is hired to complete it. So there's the uh, the pictures that, that Titian completed it with, that are now scattered London, Prod, uh, Madrid. Are uh, two of these? I think two are in London. One is in Madrid. Uh, right, um, and and where Bellini's now, uh, so the two we looked at are here in the center, set the stage, and and, and Titian came back and, and completed it. Because he became this artist associated with mythological scenes, Titian, right? Because of these wonderful paintings in Ferrara, Titian became called upon on many different occasions through the course of his career to paint images of Venus, of the goddess of love, of classical mythology. And this is getting toward the end of his life. He's still got about 15 years left. <clears throat> At this point, he paints deep into his 90s. Uh, this one stayed in his studio. He kept this one. He painted it as a model for other works of art that he would copy from this one and send them out to potential buyers who wanted it, right? So we know that this was still in Titian's studio when he died. And there are various versions of it, and none of them as good as ours at the National Gallery. Danny. What's the guy on the, on the far right? In the, in our picture? Yeah. All will be revealed. You mean him? Far right? Is that the one you're talking about? That's the far right. Oh, the other picture. The fellow, on, uh, the guy in the back. Yeah, I, I forget off the top of my head. Right? Um, uh, I, I, the older fellow there, right? I think he's been identified, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Sorry. I uh, don't have it all memorized, right? Not, I know it's not in my notes, right? So, these set the stage for later works where he does numerous images of Venus, right? For major patrons all throughout Italy. So ours was the model for other works of art uh, that copied it. And we're very lucky to have that important of a work of art. And this one I've got some nice pictures of. So we can talk about ways in which Titian uh, becomes, in history, the painter's painter. Right? Now, uh, Venus is shown with a mirror. She is uh, prettying herself for public display. Which means that you, the viewer, right, us, are witnessing her in a private moment, right? This is not Venus like Botticelli painted her. This is Venus getting ready to be the goddess of love by making herself as beautiful as is humanly possible. And Titian, as a painter, wants to emphasize this element of her. So she's checking her hairdo. She's checking her pearls. She's checking her beauty. It's vanity in the mirror. And you can see that in that mirror, uh, Titian only gives us one of her eyes, just barely peeking out. The, and the mirror is held up by Cupid, and we know it's Cupid because directly beneath his feet are his arrows. Right? Cupid is the son of Venus. Do you guys know that? Up top of your head, right? Cupid is Venus's son. So when Venus wants the rest of the world to fall in love, she sends her kid out to do it. You know, just like I got sent out by my dad to mow the lawn, right? Cupid goes out and he shoots arrows, and that makes us fall in love, right? Whoever the arrow hits. And so here he is, probably going to put the arrows on soon, but the idea is that he's not holding the arrows, he's holding the mirror, because what's going to inspire love? It's going to be Venus, right? So maybe he doesn't even need those darned arrows because the beauty of Venus is, is plenty in itself. Right? 
But he's holding the mirror for her, and the reflection is kind of cockeyed, isn't it? If you think about how we would see that mirror, we really wouldn't see her face in the mirror from this angle, right? And there's a certain strangeness that makes that eye almost begin to look at you through the mirror as if she's sort of watching us as she's checking herself out, right? And there's another figure behind her, one of Cupid's friends. We tend to call them either Puti, P-U-T-T-I, which just is the Roman word for little boy, or also erotes, E-R-O-T-E-S. These are terms for these, you know, Cupid's little helpers. And he's putting a, a wreath on her head. He's crowning her with glory. And you'll see that the wreath has flowers in it. This is, she's crowned, he's crowning her for being so beautiful, right? The triumph of beauty. And that element, the fact that this is meant to be a beautiful Venus, is something that's taken up throughout the entire picture. It's really all about sensuality and touch and beauty, how these th three things work together. So the pose that she has, she's got one arm across her chest. This way, right? And the other arm in front of her crotch, right? but holding on to the fur of that velvet and embroidered rope, right? And with one hand down and one hand across the chest, that makes her very similar to the traditional type of her Venus. So remember with Botticelli's Venus, we talked about the fact that this was based on old Roman statues where she's somewhat modest yet because she's attempting to cover herself up, right? Ali saw a couple of these in Rome a year ago or two years ago now, right? Uh, the, the modest Venus type. And even though she's seated, even though she's in her boudoir, right? Her toilet, they often called it toilette, right? The little cloth. That's what toilet comes from, you know, little cloth. Toile is cloth, right? Uh, the woman's boudoir where she, her makeup room. Even though she's seated there, she still has that, that bit of classical tradition coming through. Oh, what did I just do? Where am I? Here. I've got some really lovely details of this. Um, again, this idea that it's about sensuality and touch is that her hand comes across that velvet uh, fabric and then buries its fingers into the fur lining of it. It inspires touch. And that makes you think about the other hand that's here on the soft of her chest. Right? This is a painting that is meant to be, it's meant to be looked at. By, by looking at it, right, you think about touching. You think about your other senses as well. And as it appeals to our eye, one of the things that Titian is really good at, really good at, and very, very modern, is how he... This is, a, this is going to be good. It's how he applies the paint to the canvas. Now, when we looked at some artists before, most of the artists that we've looked at before, right? When we looked at them close, take Van Eyck. When we look close at Jan Van Eyck, and they're both painting in oil paints. When we look close at Jan Van Eyck, we were kind of amazed at the sort of crystalline detail of things, right? We could see the light coming through the window and refracting through those blown glass circles, you know? And you, you'd look up above and you'd just see these things that would, but you never saw brush strokes. It looked as if it were sort of enamel or something. You know? You didn't ever, it never broke down to suggest that anybody had ever really made it. It just kind of existed. It was wonderful, magical thing. With Titian, we see the craft. Look at the way in which, if you look at the highlight of that, Robe, that wonderful, it's a beautiful color. But B, look at how, as you look at it, you begin to realize how he laid the painting. You see traces of his craftsmanship, traces of his uh, actions. It's something you don't ever really see with with a lot of painters in your time. That's not something you really talk about. So even like Leonardo, right? We get close up and we're kind of amazed at like the way things 
fade into and out of the smoky light, right? But did you ever see brush strokes? You know, you, you, you didn't think about it as a painting. You thought about it as Ginevra da Benci or Mona Lisa, right? You didn't really think about it as a surface with, with a bunch of paint on it. And with Titian, we're very much aware of that. And it's flashy. And he doesn't, when he puts the paint down, he doesn't come back and then blend the highlights into the shadows. Right? Look at this area just here. Right? And you can still see this remnant of that this was a single stroke of paint. Boom, there. And then you come back and blend it. Right? Down in here. Look at that. That highlight, right? He's just jabbed it down in there and he doesn't come back and blend it in to model it from the highlight to the shadow. Your eye does that just fine. And this is really kind of a fascinating thing about Titian as an artist. This is why he's so popular with other painters. is because he shows off in a way how good he is at applying paint. The actual act of what does a painter do? A painter puts paint on a canvas. right? And by the way, he's working on canvas now. Part of the reason he moves to canvas is he likes the way it picks up the paint, we think. Right? He's one of the first artists to work primarily on canvas. But the more we look at it, the more we realize that we see these things, and they look almost quasi-unfinished by comparison with other artists. And this is one of the things that attracts other painters to Titian. Now, right up until, right up to the, the present day, people adore Titian. People are always channeling ideas from him. You talk to painters, you see interviews with painters, they'll talk about, they talk about the Renaissance, they'll talk about Titian. Right? He's the man. Um, another close detail where you can even see some of the canvas coming through and what I was just talking about, how so little of it is actually blended. Right? How oftentimes when we look close at the canvas we can see these traces of Titian's activity. The stripes in that bench that Cupid is standing on, that wonderful blue uh, of the cloth that he's holding between his hand and the mirror, um, which by the way we couldn't see up until about three years ago when it was cleaned. It was just sort of disappeared in the darkness. Right? He's a fantastic colorist and he's a fantastic applier of paint. And that makes him an ongoing, uh, an artist of ongoing interest to, to other artists. And we'll see this. Um, as we move our way through uh, the, on, the coming history of art. With Titian, we're kind of at the end of the Renaissance in a way, uh, the high Renaissance at least. Uh, we're even in a certain way kind of beyond it. Uh, the Renaissance more or less ends, in a lot of historians' mind, around 1520. Many of the major artists of the Renaissance, Raphael and Leonardo, for example, are dead by 1520. Uh, the Pope in Rome, Pope Julius II, who's a major driver of the Renaissance, he's dead too. Right? The Catholic Church has had its authority questioned by Martin Luther in Germany by 1520. The central authority of the Church is no longer a central authority. All of these issues together cause a sort of period of unsettledness after that period. Now, some of our Renaissance artists, Michelangelo Titian, live forever, right? Live into the 1560s, 1570s, well past the Renaissance and the high point of the Renaissance. Right? But what we'll see next is that for most artists after 1520, Art gets really strange. Renaissance art goes to pot in a kind of cool way. And the rules of Renaissance art seem to be broken in a lot of interesting ways by artists in Florence and Rome. So when we talk about Renaissance art, right, we talk about balance and stability, right, perfection and harmony. Right? Whether it's Raphael or Leonardo, this idea of a sort of a geometrical stability, the you know, pyramids, triangles of form that sit solid, right? 
a, a sense of a space that's been made rational through perspective uh, that seems unified. She's fairly large and there's not much between her in the background, but it, it seems as if it's a single space that spreads back into the distance. Right? The Renaissance presented us a, a world of harmony. Even the colors seem to be chosen for particular kinds of color harmony. Right? After around 1520, we start to see these rules break down. And I want to look at a few of these later works. Here's Bronzino, the Holy Family. What a strange picture this is. And uh, I'll explain why, right? Um, there's no there there. There's no setting for these figures. There's lighting, there's some brown background, but there's no real setting for the figure. It's deeply crowded. It's almost as if there's not enough space inside the frame for all the pictures to the point where they're cropped out often as figures. The Virgin Mary is there in the center with the green uh, cap on. That's her mother, St. Anne, in the lower left corner. That's St. Joseph in the upper right. John the Baptist and Christ down below. The Baptist is pointing to Christ. Just as he will eventually say, behold the Lamb of God. But look at how strange the arrangement of space is. Where the Baptist is down there, uh, Jesus must be sitting on some sort of weird table that comes between the Baptist and St. Anne. Try to make sense of how this is arranged in three dimensions. And you realize he's on this little bow of land with the St. Anne on one side, the Baptist on the other, the Virgin behind it, Joseph leaning over the shoulder and kind of looking over his shoulder at her. This is something that's not as unified and harmonious as Raphael, as Leonardo, as Michelangelo. And we historians, looking back at these later Renaissance pictures, after around 1520, looked at them and said, you know what, this is, this is just not the same. And we gave it a title, a term, and it's called mannerism. Now, and Agnolo Bronzino, working in the 1520s, did not call himself mannerist. Right? He would have still called himself Renaissance. But what we see happening with his work and the work of others is an interest in an art that is increasingly more artificial. Less natural and realistic. And that artificiality comes through the crowding of the image, comes through new color choices. The green of the virgin's cowl against the pink and red. Pinks. Have we seen much in the way of pinks? Right? We'll see some even hotter pinks coming up. Uh, but I guess the pink and red of her robe, the sort of uh, purple of Joseph's uh, uh, bandana, right? Uh, you get these sort of strange color combinations. You also get these incredibly strange poses. Look at Jesus, right? He's blessing us, but he's contorted in space. Twisting around to look at mom, but his body twisting the other way. And then as his body spills down, it's almost as if there's not quite enough room on that little ledge for him. That he's sort of precariously placed. All of these are the hallmarks of mannerist art. Crowding, strange colors, artificial poses. And that's why they call it mannerism. We think about it as being mannered. Right? Learn your manners. Manners are ways of behaving that aren't natural. But they're learned. And so when something is mannered, right? when we use that term in English, we're talking about somebody who, you know, speaks with a British accent when they really have none. Right? And drink their tea with their pinky out. Right? These are mannerisms. Right? They're affectations. 
And this is a very affected kind of art that we begin to see creep in. Why does this happen? We don't know. How did they not see that they were doing something different? We don't know. It could have everything to do with the fact that they're looking back at Raphael and they're looking back at Leonardo instead of looking directly at nature. Right? When you make art based on art, it gets more artificial. When you make art based on observation of nature, it becomes fresher and more direct. But also it's a period when uh, stability in Europe had started to break down, politically, socially. Again, Martin Luther and the Reformation in 1517. Numerous wars between the different countries in Europe, some of them fueled by the growth of Protestantism, may have everything to do with it. And then there's also the taste of the patrons, wanting something elegant. To where elegance replaces realism and naturalism. Another strange and crowded picture, very imbalanced by Andrea del Sarto, uh, also very mannerist in its way. Uh, this is uh, was begun when, when del Sarto started this thing. Right, he started it as a, a holy family picture. This is going to be Jesus and the Baptist. So probably her dress wasn't open. With, and he decided to change it to become an allegorical picture, the allegory of charity. Charity, uh, you know, giving of oneself selflessly is usually personified as a woman breastfeeding, surrounded by children that she will nurture. And so that's what this ends up being. But then look at the bodies and look at the arrangement of space. It looks like Jesus is standing on a steamer trunk or something. Not Jesus, the, the child figure, the one that used to be Jesus. is standing on a steamer trunk down below. Right. Uh, these uh, fabrics piled up on either side. But look, is that a balanced pose? He looks like he's teetering almost uh, on his points to the point where he's leaning into the figure of charity, needing the support that she's giving him under his arm. More so than him, the kid on the left, with the gesture out toward us, is also sort of coming up, kneeling on that same, and almost like he's climbing up. And if we look at the bodily proportions as the hand comes toward us, right, you'll notice that the hand is a little bit too small for the foreshortening, because it's nearer to us. There are just these strange body proportions, the neck a little bit too long. The way it sits on the body, a little strange. You can't imagine Leonardo making this, or Raphael. Right? Even though some of the roots of it might well be there. Right? So this, this new, strangely artificial style takes root around 1520, 1525. And we begin to see it through most of the rest of the 16th century. Even with artists like Titian and Michelangelo, who are still alive. Right? Now, our picture of charity uh, was altered to become charity from a Madonna and child image when it was purchased by the King of France. Now, Andrea del Sarto and Agnolo Bronzino are both active in Florence, the main center of the Renaissance for most of it. Francis I is this Italophile. He loves Italian art. We've heard of him before, haven't we? Remember where we heard of Francis I, the King of France? We've mentioned him before in class. Sorry? It's Da Vinci, exactly right. He's the guy that hires Leonardo da Vinci to come spend his last days, his dying days, if you will, dying years, in, in, uh, in France, right, working for Francis I. So going back, right, both of these images were made for him. Ours from the National Gallery was altered from a Madonna and child into this allegorical picture for Francis. He commissions from, uh, as well from Bronzino, who we looked at, an, another allegorical picture of Venus, right? 
And he, these are part of his campaign to bring the Renaissance to France. But really what he wound up doing was bringing mannerism to France. Right? So uh, I want to look at the one on the right a little bit more closely. Um, oh, also, by the way, he bought the Michelangelo's that weren't being used, right? I mean, he's, he's wholeheartedly trying to bring Italian Renaissance art to France. So the dying captive from Michelangelo winds up in the Louvre. I like her looking at him in the back. Like, whoo, look at that, right? But uh, anyway, these come to France in particular because Francis I is buying Italian art as much as he can, right? Now, mannerism. Uh, that's Cupid on the left, the guy with the jeweled halberd over his shoulder, not the screaming figure, right? But just try to put that body together in your mind. How does that body of Cupid work, right? So here's a spine, and there's a shoulder blade, and that's the head that's supposed to sit on that shoulder, right? It doesn't work, does it? I mean, there's no way. I mean, even if it did work, even if you could put those parts together, that's a pose you can't hold very long. And in fact, it looks a lot like that Del Sarto that we just saw, where the figure in the background is kind of climbing up and this really kind of uncomfortable one knee up sort of thing. You know? So Cupid is over there. It's just the body makes no sense whatsoever. But you know what it is? It's sensual, right? Nice buttocks, right? Uh, legs, right? Look at the, the little boy on the far right, right? It's a very sensual sort of pose. You get these sort of wonderful body parts that are just further along. And again, um, kind of like what we saw with Titian, this, this, this idea of touch, because Cupid, and this is the theme of the picture, right? Cupid is um, embracing his mother. This is incest, right? So, and uh, Francis I, the king of France, loves these sort of highly elaborate allegorical scenes from the ancient world that you almost need a tour guide to, to, to help you read. Because left to yourself, like, what, what the heck's going on? And what's going on here is um, Cupid has been hit. No, excuse me. Venus has been hit with one of Cupid's arrows. So she's holding them. Right? And because she's been hit with one of Cupid's arrows, she now is going to fall in love. And who does she fall in love with but her own son, Cupid? Which is stupid, folly, right? So on the right, the kid with the pink, the giggling baby, that's a personification of foolishness, of folly. And he is rejoicing. We knew, look what's happened, craziness, right? And behind him is Father Time, who's revealing all of this stupidity by pulling the curtain back, right? And the other figures, right, are envy and, and uh, deceit, and they're, they're trying to uh, hide what's going on. Uh, but you'll notice the crowding, right? The jungle, the strange anatomies, the odd colors, really bright and kind of jarring. Lower left corner with the pink pillow and the green quiver. Cupid's quiver. In the, sorry, lower left corner, right? Uh, the purples and pinks and blues and greens along the right hand border. The fact that everything seems to be flattened into almost no space whatsoever. And of course those bodies, all of which are so strange. All of this is, is one of the things that inspired us to think about this differently from Renaissance art. That it's mannered, it's artificial, it's strange. Now, Bronzino has included stuff to help us understand what's going on. So Father Time, we know is Father Time because there's an hourglass behind him. Look at that arm, right? I think he's probably been looking at Michelangelo a little bit. A highly muscular arm that's pulling back uh, the curtain to reveal the craziness that's taking place, right? God, she's tonguing him. Ugh. Right? Uh, but Francis loved this sort of stuff. It's erotic. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's learned, it's full of classical illusions, it's complex, right, to the point of just being strange, right? 
there's our, our baby Folly with a handful of flowers that he's going to strewn about, stray about. Uh, I thought I cut these out, but I didn't. Okay, cute little doves in the corner. They're canoodling too, just like Venus and Cupid set the theme for the scene. And then there's this figure behind Folly, who again, what a strange, it's a human, a girl's head, right, on a body that's part lion and part snake. You see that? Right, so the body comes down with this scaly bit that wraps around Cupid's feet, and then there's a lion's paw directly behind it, and she's holding in one hand a honeycomb. She's pleasure, sensual pleasure, right, honey. But how does that hand work? That's her hand. And it's just, I can't do it, right? And that's, that's mannerism, because it's the elegance of the details that supersedes the unity the harmony of the overall composition, right? Or of the individual parts, right? These become secondary to this, this sort of sensuous beauty, right? So Francis is buying these things from Italy, okay? We're going to be talking a little bit about French art. We haven't really seen much since early on, right? But he's trying to import Italian ideas, lock, stock, and barrel into France. And most of these things are going into his palace. He has uh, converted this old hunting lodge. Can you believe it? A hunting lodge? Into one of his palaces outside of Paris. It's only about 50 miles outside of Paris. Uh, the Palace of Fontainebleau. Right? So Francis I commissions architects to build the courtyards that you see here. Um, and inside there are numerous rooms that are full of decorations, um, and he hires Italian artists to come and decorate it, right? And Italian architects to help build it, right? The two artists that he hires primarily to decorate the interior are Rosso Fiorentino and Francesco Primaticcio. And they arrive uh, 1530 for, Fior for Rosso, 1540 for Primaticcio, uh, or 40-ish. And they decorate different rooms inside of Fontainebleau for Francis. And these rooms are just as mannerist as anything. In fact, they're probably the best examples of mannerism anywhere. Primaticcio does the sculptural figures that surround the central paintings by Rosso. And these are mythological scenes. Again, sensual sexualized. This is one of the loves of Jupiter. Do you know the story of the loves of Jupiter? Jupiter had this thing for humans, right? He's a god, but he didn't want, he was restless. Uh, made his wife all pretty upset. Um, but he, he wanted to sleep with humans. And the problem was, being a god, you couldn't. It was prohibited. So he would have to disguise himself in order to for the various humans that he was lusting after, for them to allow him to have his way. And the way he did it was he appeared to each one of them in a way that he knew he could get away with it. So he, he appeared to them in a form that uh, uh, appealed to their weaknesses. Right? And here, Jupiter is... Uh, going to have sex with Denaya by appearing to her as a shower of golden coins. Right? So the, uh, the appearances of Jupiter are not always human form because he has to hide his godlike nature. So here she is. Uh, he knows that she's prone to greed. And we see heavens opening up and a shower of gold coins coming right between her knees. Right? as if not to make it at all difficult to understand, right? Again, sensual, uh, very mannerist in the strange anatomies. Uh, this is particularly apparent in, the, in the, uh, the stucco pieces on the side, but also even in the Denia figure in the center, including that small Cupid figure uh, moving away from it, right? Some of them we have no idea 
really what they are. Conquest of innocence. And I, I bring this in because prints were made after these, engravings were made after these to be circulated as sort of mementos of your visit to Fontainebleau. You can make your own little Fontainebleau in your home, right? <clears throat> and so Rosser designs this, this theme of, the, of innocence being conquered. Conquered by who? I'm not 100% sure. There's a lot of art historians out there have written quite a bit about these paintings because they're so learned and so complex and there was never really a guidebook written so that we're not 100% sure of exactly what Rosso intended, right? But certainly ignorance is personified a number of times over with these blindfolded figures, right? Uh, hands up in the air, don't know where they're headed, uh, slumped down as well. But then we have a figure with a sword moving into a well-lit interior. Right? Is he the one that's conquering innocence? Yeah? One last slide and then we'll quit. A um, number of printmakers were hired by Francis to make these designs after uh, the frescoes in Fontainebleau. And so here is a sacrifice to our old friend Priapus. Fortunately, he's not shown to us again. We don't have to divert our eyes this time. But again, how, how mannerist is this? Look at the figure in the center. This guy here, right? This body with these rippling muscles that look more like silly putty on his back or something, you know? Uh, but the form that becomes very difficult to read, the crowning of the overall composition. There's not enough room for all of these figures. The imbalance that we see, these are all hallmarks of mannerism. This movement in late Renaissance art that moves away from the balance and the stability and harmony of the high Renaissance. Now, on Tuesday, we'll look at one more uh, group of mannerist artists, and we'll move on to Northern Europe, go back to Germany and the Low Countries, see what's going on there get ourselves ready for the exam, which is a uh, week from Monday, right? So you've got all those review stuff. If you weren't here on on, Tuesday, on Monday, we talked about that uh, in class, so talk to your classmates about it. And again, remember that your revision of your bibliography is due today. So make sure you get that to me, okay? And if I haven't written you back, that means I haven't received it yet. <laughs>